Hello again guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video we are taking a look at an add-on that I know for many of you has been eagerly anticipated. That is of course India Fox Techo's rendition of the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II. The F-35 has just been released although I believe there's already quite a bit of pre-release material floating around online so you're probably quite familiar with the aircraft if it's one that you were already interested in purchasing. Obviously India Fox Techo have a pretty good track record in Microsoft Flight Simulator, both their MB339 and their T-45 rather nice products for the sim. Today's video will be a full review flight and I have to say it's quite a bumper schedule that we have for the sortie today. Initially we're going to be departing off the deck of the HMS Queen Elizabeth. We're going to be taking the aircraft up towards RAF Valley. Once we're on the ground in Valley we'll take a little bit of a closer look at some of the visual modelling and various features of the aircraft. We'll then take the aircraft of course down to the Mac Loop for a little bit of a test of its handling characteristics. After that we'll return to the carrier and we'll make a vertical landing back onto the deck of the HMS Queen Elizabeth. As usual as we go we'll be running through all of the relevant checks trying to operate the aircraft as accurately as we can. And finally we'll finish up the video with my overall thoughts and opinions on the product. As always if you do enjoy the video then please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. I'm pretty keen to give the F-35 a go myself so let's now head for the cockpit and we'll get the aircraft started up. So welcome to the cockpit of the F-35 and the deck of the HMS Queen Elizabeth. As I mentioned during the introduction we'll take a more detailed look at the aircraft once we've got ourselves up to RAF Valley. For now though we can begin running through the start procedures and the first thing we'll do there is turn the master battery switch on. We'll just wait for the right hand side of the PCD or the panoramic cockpit display to initialise and once that's up and running we can bring up the engine start checklist. So the screen is initialised, we'll come to the right hand outermost portal, we'll go to menu and we'll bring up the checklist. For the engine start the part brake switch is set on. Safety pins, they are actually modelled on the aircraft, we have a safety pin both for the seat and for the canopy, I've already removed both of those. Harness is secure, IPP switch can go on. ICC 1 and 2 switches can both go on. Compression knob can go to normal. You'll notice a little bit of jerkiness in the frame rate at the moment. I'm not sure if that's the aircraft or the carrier. We'll obviously keep a close eye on that throughout the review. So the cabin pressure knob is set to normal. Battery switch, of course, that should already be on. We turn that on to initialize the screen. Engine switch is set to normal and that's caged up. PCD, we want to bring up the ICAWS or the Integrated Caution Advisory and Warning System. To do that we can just come to the inner right portal and we'll expand the ICAWS screen. In terms of the aircraft state we have an engine RPM low warning, of course expecting to see that at the moment with the engine not running, a generator low caution, a main fuel shuttle valve closed caution and FCS degraded caution. Again expecting to see all of those at the moment. In terms of advisories we have canopy unlocked and parking brake set. Next we'll bring up the PCD fuel page and we're looking to open up the main fuel shuttle valve. To do that we can expand the fuel page and we'll click on the MFSOV prompt and the main fuel shuttle valve is now open. Lastly we'll come on to the engine page and there we're just checking our engine parameters and engine status. IPP selector is set to auto, throttle is set to idle. Light switches, so we'll come up to menu, we'll go onto the lights page, we'll get the position lights on. Unfortunately we don't seem to be able to set those to flash, that seems to be an issue with most India Fox Teco aircraft, it may well be a, a sim coding issue. We'll leave the strobes off for now. So light switches are set as required, IPP selector can go to start. 
So as you can see, a very simplistic process to get the aircraft started up, and indeed the F-35 is a very simplistic aircraft in general. Obviously automation taking care of a lot of the work. Anyway, I'll keep quiet now, we'll watch the engine start up, and I'll come back to you again once the engine's stabilised. Okay, so we do have a good start. Unfortunately though, we did have a crash to desktop there, so if anything's changed since we were last in the cockpit, you'll have to forgive me. We'll definitely be talking more about that later on. Anyway, finishing up our engine start checks, the IC AWS lights are out. The checklist actually calls for the IPP selector to go to start, which I would imagine is a typo since the selector actually returned to the auto position itself as we have there. PCD configuration will leave as is for now. And HMD selector, that can go to night, it's still fairly low light conditions outside. You can see with the uh, auto there, still a little bit bright at the moment. Interestingly, the F-35, apparently the first fighter in decades not to have a dedicated HUD, it's just the HMD device. And a little bit of a limitation in the sim, but as you can see at the moment, the HMD only draws directly in front of the pilot's vision. Anyway, that's the engine start checks complete, moving on to the taxi checks. Flight plan has been loaded. Currently you can only do that via the SIMS inbuilt flight planning tools. You can't currently do that via the aircraft. And we have the GPS selected leading us out towards waypoint 1. SMS page, so the stores management system page. Just checking there that the doors are closed. Wing fold not applicable as we're currently in the B model. On the FCS page, just checking everything there in the green. We'll hit the FCS reset button, although according to the manual that currently doesn't do anything. And checking the trims, we'll hit trim reset, making sure that the trims are in neutral. We'll carry out a flight control check. So we have full up, full down, and neutral. Full left, full right, and neutral. And just checking the rudder. Full left, full right, and neutral. Harness is secure. On the PCD, we'll go back to the engine page. Once again, just checking the engine parameters. Onto the fuel page. So we've got 12.9 tonnes of fuel on board, more than enough to get us up towards the valley. Just burning down the outer tanks at the moment. And we'll leave Joker fuel and Bingo fuel as is. And lastly, checking the EFIS. So the altimeter is set, flight director's off, HSI looks good, EFIS is checked. Canopy we can close and lock. And much like the F-16, I really like the F-35, it feels quite futuristic with that canopy, like some sort of spacecraft. So canopy is closed and locked, seat we can arm. And that's now in the armed position. PCD PHM page, or the prognostics and health management page. There we're just looking for all systems go. Obviously you can see there's a few systems not currently modelled on the aircraft. External lights will set, so we'll come up to menu. Go to lights once again. We've got the position lights on, we'll turn on the strobes as well now. And we'll get the landing and taxi lights on. And lastly the parking brake can come off. We'll just go back to engine page there on the PCD. So park brake is off. We'll get ourselves taxied into position, obviously a very short taxi here. We'll just get ourselves lined up with the ski ramp. And once we're in position, we'll run through the before takeoff checks and get ourselves into the short takeoff configuration. So nicely lined up there with the ski jump, park brake can go on once again. We have limited numbers of park brake applications, and currently now we have 29 there. So running through the takeoff checks, external lights are set as required. PCD engine page. 
is checked. PCD configuration will leave again as is just for now. Throttle is set as required. And we're going to the short takeoff configuration. So to do that we can just hit the hook stovall button. Or oh, I've got that assigned as well to my HOTAS. And the duct cover should now open up and the fan and the engine exhaust should deploy into the stovall mode. Ok so we are now in the short takeoff and vertical landing configuration, the before takeoff checks are complete. So we'll hit menu, we'll set the PCD to the cruise configuration. Unfortunately during the transition there we actually had another crash to desktop so that does seem to be a little bit of an issue with the product as it stands. Again we'll talk more about that later on in the video. Anyway the takeoff is a great opportunity to show you what a sophisticated airframe the F-35 actually is. If we wanted to enter straight into the hover right now we need to be below 40,600 pounds. Our current gross weight 45,400 so about 5,000 pounds too heavy. And as you can see the aircraft actually wouldn't let us enter into the hover in our current configuration. So we'll be carrying out a short takeoff and for the sake of interest we're actually going to carry out an automatic short takeoff. The aircraft can get us airborne almost entirely automatically, it will actually accelerate for us, take off in the shortest possible distance. According to the manual it should automatically retract the landing gear although I haven't seen it do that I suspect we'll have to do that manually and then it will convert us into conventional flight. So as I say pretty sophisticated rather interesting piece of kit. We'll take the part brake off, we'll hold the aircraft on the brakes momentarily. You can see that the auto takeoff prompt is available there in blue so we'll hit that. I'm actually just going to rest my hands in my lap just to prove I'm not touching any of the controls. The only controls we do need to use are the rudder pedals just to keep the aircraft straight. As soon as we take our feet off the brakes the aircraft will carry out the takeoff. So feet off the brakes you can see the thrust coming up. Just using the rudder to keep us straight. And the aircraft automatically getting us airborne there. You can see we cleared the deck even before we hit the ramp so we can get off in pretty short order. We should accelerate up to around 185 knots for the climb. And as you can see that gear not coming up automatically but we're up through 300 feet on the rad out so we'll take the gear up. There's our 185 knot climb speed. We're now in the slow flight phase, we'll take more of a look at that once we come back to the carrier later on. But the aircraft will now essentially continue to climb with the stovel mode selected at 185 knots until we intervene. Ok so we're still climbing away in slow flight at the moment, we've still got stovel mode selected, just coming up on 2000 feet. We'll transition now into conventional flight, to do that we can either hit the hook stovel switch once again. I'll use my hardware switch though. So we're now in conventional flight, that big fan behind us closing up, the engine exhaust transitioning into the horizontal position and the afterburner kicking in. The speed building up very nicely there as it does so. We'll just wait until we're up through 400 knots and then we'll cancel the afterburner. And coming on to our heading out towards waypoint 2. There's 400 knots so we'll come back to full military power. And just continuing to climb at around 400 knots. Slightly further right on the heading, we're looking for a heading of 300. So there's 300. Outside air temperature is minus 7, we're obviously going to be entering into the clouds, so we'll take the anti-ice on. And we'll just pitch up slightly more to maintain around 400 knots here in the climb. Overall the F-35 is a very easy aircraft to fly, very characteristic of most fly-by-wire aircraft. Pretty much just sits exactly where you put it, auto trims accordingly. I will say there does seem to be a little bit of lag in the auto trim, I'm not sure whether or not that's realistic to the real world aircraft, but 
I'm just going off the Airbus here, certainly the aircraft generally tends to auto trim pretty quickly in reality. Almost as soon as you place it, it will just sit there. But again, overall the aircraft very easy to fly, very smooth on the controls, quite pleasant. But it certainly very much feels like a fly-by-wire aircraft, which of course is a good thing given that it is. Getting a little bit heavy now in pitch. So I'm not quite sure what's going on with the auto trim there. Actually having to come quite far back on the stick just to maintain that speed. Coming up through some cloud. And just crossing over the southern coastline of the UK at the moment. We're slightly left on our heading so we'll correct that. We'll climb up to around 30,000 feet, whatever's good enough to put us above the, uh, the cloud tops here. So 299 on the heading now out towards Yeovilton, 31 miles to run, We're looking at an estimated en route time of 4 minutes 30 seconds at our current speed. And as you can see, just coming up on the cloud tops. That thrust seems to have dropped off quite dramatically there as well, we've maintained the same throttle position. Interestingly the throttle also, I'm literally moving it an absolute fraction there and we're jumping in rather large increments. I'm not sure whether or not that's accurate to the uh, real world aircraft. We're dropping from around uh, 92 to around 85 there. There could be some sort of thrust mode on the aircraft, I have no idea. We'll go for 35,000 feet, that should put us nicely clear of the clouds. And getting pretty bright up here on top of the clouds now, so we're going to auto on the HUD. Just to make the HUD a little bit more visible. And we'll go for about 480 on the speed, so we'll start coming back on the thrust, we'll level the aircraft off. We'll just put the uh, flight path vector there on the horizon line, that should give us straight and level flight. Again, quite difficult to get an accurate thrust setting on the aircraft with the throttle being as sensitive as it is. Anyway, we'll maintain 480 knots, that makes our speed, distance and time calculations pretty straightforward. Just trying to manually trim here a little bit at the moment, it doesn't seem as though the aircraft is actually auto trimming. I believe it should be. As I say, either the auto trim is very slow to react at this altitude or it's just not working at all. Anyway, we're more or less straight and level now at 35,000 feet. Speed's looking good. Got 8 miles to run, we're almost overhead the Ovalton already. Certainly getting a pretty cracking pace on in the F-35, as you'd expect. So we'll just wait until we're overhead the Ovalton. Just going to keep trying to trim the aircraft here, I'm quite interested to see exactly what it does. As I said, it doesn't feel like we're auto trimming anymore. Unfortunately, due to the cloud, we can't see Yeovilton, but it's down below us. And above the cloud now, so we'll get the anti-ice system off. And now tracking up towards waypoint 3, which is uh, St. Athen Air Base. So we'll just get ourselves back onto heading, nicely trimmed out now here, straight and level. As usual, we'll head outside the aircraft as we make our way up towards RAF Valley. And I'll come back to you again once we're on final approach in towards Valley itself. Approach button 17, 17 times 2, 2, 0 and a quarter. 
Okay, so we're just coming on to final approach for runway 01 at RAF Valley. The wind's more or less straight down the runway. We've just completed the last of our landing checks. Just let that speed slowly reduce. We want an approach speed of around 150 knots. Showing slightly high here on the Pappy at the moment, so we'll just correct that. And we want to try and keep the flight path vector within the E bracket there as best we can. Looking good again now on the Pappy. Still about 10 knots fast, so just coming off the uh, power. The aircraft is much more sensitive on the controls than I thought it would be. It's quite twitchy actually in the approach configuration. Particularly for a fly-by-wire aircraft. Twitch is perhaps not quite the right word, but you certainly need to make lots of minor adjustments to keep it where you want it. And that flight path vector, probably not quite accurate. If we're on the Pappy, we're looking to touch down in the touchdown zone, but it looks at the moment like we're touching down at the other end of the runway. Looking good now on the approach speed, just coming back inside the bracket. Two reds, two whites on the Pappy. So just starting to reduce that descent rate, coming off the power. Let's touch down. Start coming onto the brakes. Now we'll get the aircraft slowed down, we'll vacate at the next available right. So we now have our F-35 parked up here on the apron at RAF Valley. Looks like our pilot's gone off for a little bit of a bathroom break. As I mentioned during the introduction, I think this would be a great opportunity to take a look at a few of the aircraft features in a little bit more detail. Hopefully by now you should have a little bit more of a feel for the aircraft's texturing and modelling both internally and externally, but we'll take a look at those a little bit more closely. We'll also briefly cover off the aircraft's weapon systems, and finally we'll touch a little bit more on the PCD, or the Panoramic Cockpit Display. So as far as the aircraft's modelling goes, overall I would say it's a pretty nice effort on the F-35. Certainly in terms of the shape and the contouring of the aircraft, I think the aircraft looks quite good. I will say though that I don't think the modelling or indeed the texturing is quite up to the same standards as for example the India Fox Teco T-45. You can see here on the electro-optical targeting system for example, the little glass house just in front of the nose wheel, that doesn't really look very lifelike, not very photorealistic. Overall though, the modelling detail is good, I would say it sits broadly in the middle of what we can expect in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Not as good as some of the best add-ons that we've seen, but certainly more than adequate. I would say that the same is true on the aircraft's external texturing. Again, overall the textures are more than adequate, but the resolution on some of them a little bit lower than we've seen on other India Fox Teco products. The F-35 does come with visible weapons, which is great, however, as always be advised that you will have to purchase the aircraft outside of the in-sim marketplace if you do want visible munitions on the aircraft. To fit the weapons, it's simply a case of adjusting the weights in the aircraft's fuel and load manager. Some people might prefer that. Personally, I find that a little bit clunky. You've obviously got to input the correct weights as well, which might not be to hand on some occasions. Nonetheless, it's fairly straightforward to do. It's explained in the manual. You can fit either the pylons or the weapons themselves. In terms of munitions, you can fit AIM-9 Sidewinder missiles to the outer hardpoints on the wing. 
You can fit GBU-12s to both of the inner hard points on the wing. You can also fit a pair of GBU-12s into the weapons bay of the F-35, and the same is true you can fit a pair of AIM-120 AMRAAM missiles into the weapons bay. I believe there are also a couple of additional hard points on both the A and the C variants of the F-35. The B variant though a little bit more limited in terms of what it can carry due to the nature of its operations. And worth noting on that point that you do get both the A, the B and the C variants of the F-35 which I think is really great for the price. Offering quite a bit of variation there in terms of aircraft utility, we'll discuss more about that at the end of the video. So overall as far as the external modelling and texturing of the aircraft goes, as I said I think it's pretty decent. I would say it's above average but it's not the best that we've seen in the sim so far. Where I think that the aircraft shines is generally internally, I think the cockpit modelled very nicely although it's quite simplistic but that's purely down to design. And as you'll see in just a moment's time it's also textured pretty nicely as well. Again I think we've already had a pretty good look at the cockpit but just to show you some of the more hidden away areas. The modelling detail overall pretty good. The F-35 is pretty simplistic in nature, it's obviously designed to be quite minimal in terms of control so there's actually not a whole lot of modelling required in some respects. Again the texturing is very decent in terms of its accuracy but it doesn't quite look photorealistic, it's got a slightly more cartoonish hue to it. But that being said overall I do think the cockpit looks pretty good, you can see the level of detail in the modelling there is pretty spot on. As I say I think the internals of the aircraft really the strength of the product. You can see there as well the ejection seat safety pin that we mentioned during the startup. One thing that is worth mentioning, it's only a minor gripe but under low light conditions the PCD, the panoramic cockpit display, the big screen there that you can see in front of the pilot, that looks really good. Under bright lighting conditions though the screen doesn't hold up quite so well, you do get a slightly strange texture to it. The visuals there on the screen also not quite so easy to read but to be fair that is pretty true to life when you've got a light shining on a backlit screen. So again it is a very minor niggle but I just thought it was worth noting. Lastly we're not going to run through the full functionality of the PCD, it's fairly complex in nature. That being said a lot of the screens are actually just placeholders, many of the systems not working. I will say though that is by no means a criticism of India Fox Teco, of course the F-35 in many respects still a classified aircraft so of course they can't be expected to find information on all of the systems and model them accordingly. Overall though the complexity of the PCD is still very nice as you'll see throughout the flight quite comprehensive in terms of what you can do with the aircraft and there's multiple configurations that you can have between the various screens. Most of the major pages of the aircraft do at least have some functionality, I suspect there's a little bit of guesswork going on with some of them as well on India Fox Teco's part but again all credit to them for making a pretty nice job here I think of modelling the systems versus the information that they probably had available to them of the real world aircraft. Systems depth on the aircraft certainly isn't study level but overall I think you get a nice sense of the F-35 and there's enough depth there that you do feel like you're operating the aircraft quite accurately. Although of course again we probably won't know whether or not that's the case for many years to come. Anyway hopefully that gives you a slightly more in-depth look at the product in terms of its systems depth, its modelling and its texturing. And hopefully as well you'll have seen a little bit more of the PCD functionality that we haven't covered during the flight phases. Anyway the next part of our sortie today we're going to be putting the aircraft on a bit of a flight test around the Mach loop. So we'll get the aircraft started up once again, we'll taxi out for the holding point runway 01 and I'll meet you once the aircraft's ready for takeoff at the holding point. Okay so we're now down at the holding point for runway 01, as I say we'll try a conventional takeoff just to see how the aircraft handles that. So the part brake can come off, it's all clear on final and getting fairly bright now here in the afternoon so we'll just bump up the MFD brightness there, we'll put it on day, bumps up the backlight, just makes the displays a little bit easier to see. Get ourselves taxied into position, we'll hold on the brakes initially, it's runway 01 confirmed. So we'll hold the aircraft on the brakes, we'll come up to full military power and then we'll take the afterburner for the takeoff. So engine parameters looking good, feet off the brakes, all the way up on the throttle. In comes the afterburner. Rudder feels reasonable, coming back on the stick. Aircraft fairly heavy in pitch. Did hear a few default sounds there as well which is a touch disappointing. We'll take the gear up.
just build the speed up till 400 knots and then we'll come all the way back on the stick. We'll go through half a loop, put ourselves out heading towards the south. So coming back on the stick, obviously fly-by-wire aircraft, so the most we can manage is 7.5G I believe in the B. And the aircraft's going to manage that for us. Overall it feels pretty good in pitch. So just rolling ourselves out onto heading. Waypoint 2 is the start of the MAC loop, we're looking for a heading of 158, so we'll come out to the left. And we'll just leave the afterburner in, we'll see what sort of speed we can pick up here in more or less straight and level flight. And looks like down here at 15,000 feet, max speed's going to be around 800 knots, about Mach 1.5. Anyway, we'll now head outside the aircraft. We'll take in a little bit more of the scenery as we head down towards the Mach loop. And I'll come back to you again once we're ready to start our run. Okay, so we're just coming up on the town of Abu that's down below us at our 10 o'clock. The autopilot currently flying the aircraft, that's done a pretty reasonable job of getting us down to this point. I have had some fairly hit and miss results with it so far, it does have a few Microsoft Flight Simulator peculiarities. Anyway, the autopilot can come off, we'll overbank the aircraft, we'll get the aircraft back down towards the ground. We'll just leave the throttle in the present position for the time being, we'll build up a little bit of speed here in the descent. So Abu just off the nose, we'll follow the river in towards the town of Machenthleth, which of course is the start of the Mac loop run from this particular entry point. And I think what we'll do, we'll fly the first half of the Mac loop at high speed just to get a bit more of a feel for the aircraft's high speed handling characteristics. We'll fly the second half a little bit more of a leisurely pace. So far I'm still a little bit undecided on the aircraft's flight model. Most of the time it's a real pleasure to fly, but as I say, a little bit twitchy on the approach and every now and again it just seems to stop auto trimming. I'm not sure if that's accurate or not to the real world aircraft, but it feels a little bit off. So just following the river inbound, you can just see the town coming up off the nose now. We'll come up to full afterburner. We've got uh, 9.3 thousand pounds of fuel on board. Joker fuel's five tonnes, so we'll keep a good eye on that. If we hit Joker fuel, then we'll uh, come back off the afterburner. We'll still have enough to get back towards the carrier. Just cancel that GPWS warning. Obviously, we know we're going to be low level throughout the run. So, 3 Mach 1, we're currently doing 720 knots, just following the river for now, till we pick up the A470. Once again, a little bit too much bloom on that HUD, but you can at least read it, which is often not the case in the sim, so better to be too bright than not enough, I suppose. It's a B404 bridge passing just down below us, so still continuing to follow the river for now. And pulling quite a bit of G here as we come around the corner, up to around 3G. 8.5 thousand pounds of fuel on board. We'll get the aircraft lined up with the hills. So far flying very nicely here at high speed. Still doing about Mach 1.1. 1 
We'll cut the afterburner now as we're obviously going to be making a fairly tight turn over Dinas Malthui. And just picking up the A470 here. Come all the way back on the power as we pull some G around the turn. So up to around 7.5 G there, that's the max in the uh, F-35B I believe, so the flight computers there are doing a good job of keeping the aircraft within its limits. And just reversing the turn back round to the right, following the A470 up through Bullshit Exit. £8,000 of fuel now, still fairly decent margin there on Joker fuel. Overbanking the aircraft back down towards the ground. Get ourselves back down towards ground level as we come through Cross Foxes in. And again, pulling some pretty solid G as we come round to pick up the A487. Yeah, so as I said, overall the aircraft most of the time flies very nicely. Right now it's really good fun to fly. Seems to perform broadly as you'd expect. Pointing ourselves out towards Limmingill. And now again, pulling some G as we come through Chorus Corner, back down to about Mach 0.9 currently. The aircraft handling the G, absolutely no issues. Maintaining pretty decent speed here. We've still got the afterburner in a little bit there. We'll come back off the throttle again. Come back to full military power as we make our way through the last winding section of the run. And as we do so, the speed of course bleeding back as well. So we'll just loosely follow the valley now, out towards the exit and back towards the town of Machuntleth. Overall that was a uh, pretty speedy run, didn't take very long. We're down to £7,500 of fuel. That should be more than enough to take us back towards the carrier. We don't want to hang around for too long though, so we'll keep ourselves at full military power. We'll climb back up to a reasonable cruising altitude just to save a little bit of fuel on the way home. So we'll just replay that run in a bit of a more cinematic fashion, and I'll come back to you again once we're approaching the deck of the HMS Queen Elizabeth for our landing back onto the carrier. So welcome back, just coming up for being the HMS Queen Elizabeth. We'll continue on our downwind for now, we'll join back around for the overhead break back onto the deck. Doing about 300 knots, 2,500 feet for now, we'll obviously lose some of that altitude as we come around the corner. And just weaving our way around this bank of cloud, try and maintain visual as we make the turn. We've carried out most of our landing checks, we've just got the landing gear to come which we'll take as we come overhead for the uh, downwind and we're below 240 knots. So we'll pull some G, that'll help us bleed off some speed. We need to lose some altitude here as well. We want to be 300 knots, 800 feet as we pass the beam the carrier.
So, speed's looking good, just coming on to altitude. Heading of 280, so we want heading of 100 for the reciprocal onto downwind. And just passing beam the deck now, so we'll track outbound momentarily. And we'll start our turn now onto downwind. We want the speed below 240 knots before we take the gear, as I mentioned. And just coming up on our heading of 100 degrees. Coming up and being the deck. And there's our 240 knots, so we'll take the gear down. Once again the aircraft is starting to feel pretty heavy in pitch now, so just trimming some of that out. Just keeping an eye on the deck. And we'll start our turn around now, back towards the carrier. We'll just wait until we're lined up on final, then we'll come into the short takeoff vertical landing mode. We'll aim to be around 120 knots as we do so. So once again we'll hit the hook stovel switch. And the aircraft now going into slow flight. We'll do a quick lap around the deck just to prove how manoeuvrable the aircraft is in slow flight. So just coming up on the throttle once again we'll build up a little bit of speed here. So we'll just pass out to the right of the carrier, we'll come back round out to the left, we'll swing the aircraft through 180 degrees and then we'll come back onto the deck. But as you can see overall the aircraft is incredibly manoeuvrable and as I said incredibly easy to fly. Most of the hovering process is automated. This is way less workload than the Harrier would be that's for sure. Really it's just a case of pointing the aircraft where you want it to go, you don't really have to balance the controls which does make it easier to fly, in some ways it's a little bit less fun. And certainly in the hover as well the aircraft incredibly stable. We'll lose some of that speed, we'll come into the hover now. And the hover a little bit strange, it does take a bit of getting used to. The rudder turns the aircraft, that's fairly straightforward. But actually the stick controls the altitude. And you have to assign a couple of keys to uh, aileron trim that actually controls the forward and aft speed of the aircraft. The throttle essentially does nothing, which is a bit strange. I would have thought they would have designed the jet to have the throttle control the height. But if we want to descend we can just push down on the stick and likewise if we want to climb we just pull back on the stick. Anyway, we'll get ourselves a beam the carrier deck. We'll hold there momentarily, again just to show you exactly how stable the F-35 actually is. And the last of our landing items. Landing gear is down, the lights, we'll get the landing light on. The landing check is complete. So we'll get ourselves nicely lined up with the deck, we'll start slowing down. So it's left aileron trim to slow the aircraft down, right aileron trim to speed up. And very little input on the controls required from me, at the moment all I'm doing is just flicking my hat switch to adjust the aileron trim, that's adjusting our forward speed. So almost stationary now, by now in the Harrier you'd definitely be juggling the controls a lot to keep the aircraft in its present position. Just coming up on Joker fuel so definitely a good time to get the aircraft down onto the deck momentarily. As I say though we'll just head outside first just so that you can see exactly how stable the F-35 actually is. Water, 
So as you can see for yourselves, the aircraft pretty much steady as a rock there without any input from the pilot. I don't know how accurate that is to the real world F-35, but it's a very impressive system if it's true to life. Anyway, we'll just ease ourselves onto the deck using a little bit of right stick here at the moment just to drift us over towards... We're aiming to land on the uh, the white line just off to the right of the cockpit combing there at the moment. And just pushing slightly forward on the stick to lose some altitude. Also using a little bit of aileron trim there just to ease us forward in terms of our forward motion. Obviously we want to keep our vertical speed nice and low as we descend down towards the deck. And not touching the throttle here at all to manage our vertical speed or our forward motion. As I said, it does take a little bit of getting used to. The aircraft does fly quite differently in the hover from anything else I've ever flown, but it's a nice little challenge. Bingo. Bingo. Just coming up on bingo fuel, that's fine, we're about to be back on the deck. Just holding us off as we come a little bit further forward onto our landing spot. And that's looking pretty good now, so we'll cancel that forward motion. Continuing to ease forward on the stick, just losing altitude, just lowering the aircraft. Let's touch down. As soon as we touch down, the aircraft automatically cuts the engine. We'll take the park brake on. We'll get the landing lights off. Strobes can come off as well. And we'll run through our post-flight checklist, so parking brake is set, hook and stovel button, so we'll come back to conventional flight. And once again retracting the engine exhaust and the fan there. Seat arm can go to safe. Canopy will open that up for the shutdown. Throttle is at idle. On the PCD we'll come to the PHM page. And again just checking our system status, we'd record that. SMS page. According to the checklist, we're checking that the doors are open, so we'll open up the doors now. And we just have an IC AWS caution there. Engine shut down, the HMD master selector can go off. We'll come back to the PCD fuel page. We'll come to the main fuel shutoff valve once again, and we'll just confirm we want to close that, and that'll cut the engine. Back to the PCD engine page, we'll monitor the engine shutdown. Looks as though we have a good engine rundown, we'll obviously monitor the engine cooldown there as well. Throttle is off, the IPP selector can go off, we'll get ICC 1 and 2 switches off as well, and lastly we'll get the battery switch off. So that's the shutdown checklist complete, that's also the end of our sortie in the F-35. As usual, just to round off the review, I'll give you a breakdown of my thoughts and opinions on the India Fox Teco F-35 and its strengths and weaknesses as a product. So there you go guys, the India Fox Teco F-35. A little bit tricky to know what to say about the aircraft really, I have slightly mixed feelings about the product. India Fox Teco clearly tried to achieve a lot with the F-35, in some ways they were quite successful, in other ways they were slightly wide of the mark. Overall I do like the product, I certainly enjoyed the flight. As usual though, I'll try and break the aircraft down into a few more specifics, particularly what I think is good and bad about the product. Starting with the negatives, there's one obvious major flaw for me currently with the F-35, and that's the proclivity of the aircraft to cause the sim to crash to desktop. We talked a little bit about that during the flight, and I did actually keep account of how many crashed desktops we actually had with the aircraft. Over the space of, I would say, about 8 hours recording with the aircraft, we had 9 crash to desktops. That's pretty significant of course, and I would say particularly in my sim, probably throughout the entire 18 months that I've been using Microsoft Flight Simulator I've had 4, maybe 5 crash to desktops. There's clearly an issue with the aircraft then in its current state, and I did see that previously India Fox Teco had actually delayed the release of the F-35 to try and sort out the issue. Unfortunately as well, the crash to desktop seemed to be very random in nature, there was no real rhyme or reason to any of them. Some of them happened in the external view, some of them happened internally, some of them happened while I was operating the aircraft systems, and one of them happened whilst I was sat on the ground doing absolutely nothing. 
Now, of course, it's always possible that it is just an issue with my PC, although I've noticed from some sim market reviews, other people seem to be having the same issue as well. So I think it is fair to say that there is currently an issue with the product. In of itself, that's a little bit of a stumbling block at the moment, a little bit hard to get past. I'll carry on with the rest of my points though, and worth noting, if the product is patched and fixed, I'll leave a comment down in the video description, I'll pin that, so that anybody looking to purchase the product at a later date can be notified accordingly, and I think that's a fair compromise for India Fox Teco. The rest of my negative points are more trivial in nature, although not small points, a couple of them still. As I mentioned throughout the flight, overall I really liked how the aircraft flew, but there were a couple of occasions where it felt quite strange. Again, not having flown the real jet, I can't say with any degree of certainty whether or not the behaviour is accurate or not to the real world F-35, but I suspect not. Generally speaking, the fly-by-wire behaviour was quite nice, but at times, as we looked at throughout the flight, there were a couple of occasions where the auto trim seemingly just stopped working. I could understand why that might happen in the approach configuration, but it seemed to be the case that, particularly at altitude, the aircraft got very heavy in pitch, I was having to use almost full backstick to maintain straight and level. Really having to use a ton of manual trim there to release the control forces, and even then the aircraft's handling felt a little bit off. The same on the approach, as we mentioned, the aircraft actually quite twitchy in the approach configuration on the controls. Usually on a fly-by-wire aircraft you'd actually expect the controls to be quite smooth but still responsive. Generally you'd expect the aircraft to be quite a stable platform down the approach. So again, purely conjecture on my part, but I think there are a few gremlins in the works in the flight model at the moment. I will say though that India Fox Teco have clearly accomplished quite a bit with the aircraft, you've seen all of the various modes throughout the various phases of flight. And we'll definitely be talking more about that when we cover the positives of the product. The rest of my negatives really based more around attention to detail. There are a few minor points that I think could have been improved. I did come into the F-35 with quite high expectations based on the India Fox Teco MB339 and T-45. I would say that graphically the aircraft isn't quite up to the same standards as the T-45. Certainly externally the texturing isn't quite as sharp as the T-45. The T-45 I thought looked very photorealistic. Also with the F-35, we don't seem to get any of the external ground equipment that we saw with the T-45. Things like the chocks and the external covers. It is a fairly minor point, but most aircraft now, of course, in the sim do come with such additions. The sounds I thought were generally decent. India Fox Teco claim that they've taken recordings from the real-world F-35. The only thing I would say there, and it was a little bit the same with their T-45, overall the aircraft does lack a little bit of oomph in the engine department. Similarly, there were a few other default sounds that I could hear throughout the flight. That's a little bit disappointing. Two more minor points. The manual overall pretty good in terms of covering the aircraft systems. It also gives a very nice briefing on the F-35. In terms of actually flying the aircraft though, I found it was pretty scant on detail, so there was quite a bit of guesswork in our flight today. The manual is good enough to get you started, but really nothing more than that. Although, to be fair to India Fox Teco, of course there's pretty limited information on the F-35 in the public domain. Anyway, unfortunately quite a few negatives to get through there, which is a real shame. I did enjoy the aircraft overall, and generally I really like Indy Fox Teco as a company. The F-35 certainly has plenty of strengths, it is just marred a little bit unfortunately at the moment, with the issues that it has. In terms of what I like about the aircraft, overall as I said, the flight model I thought was really good when it was all working well. The aircraft felt very responsive, very nice on the controls, and it really did feel like a fly-by-wire aircraft for the most part. The flight modes that India Fox Teco have actually managed to achieve I thought were very impressive, particularly the auto takeoff, and of course the stability that they've managed to achieve there in the hover. Graphically, we've said that the aircraft externally was above average, but nothing exemplary. Internally, I thought the jet was very nice overall, the modelling very good, the cockpit is quite simplistic, but it's obviously designed that way, and the texturing, as I said, ever so slightly cartoonish in nature, but overall very nicely done. With the product, you do still get quite a lot of bang for your buck getting all three variants of the aircraft. You get the F-35A, which is the conventional version that just does standard takeoff and landings, the F-35B, which of course we flew today, and the F-35C, which is also carrier capable, but that's catapult launched and has an arrestor hook attached. Systems-wise, although the aircraft is necessarily simplistic, overall I was actually pretty impressed. I have no idea how close it is to the real-world F-35, and I would suspect that most of us don't. But it seems to me as though India Fox Teco got the overall systems layout and logic pretty much correct. And as I mentioned during the video, I was actually pretty impressed with how much scope and breadth the PCD or the panoramic cockpit display actually had in terms of functionality. For the most part, the autopilot as well seemed to do a pretty decent job of flying the jet, the same for the auto throttle. Worth noting, I did have a few upsets, but that seems to be very typical in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And once again, on the subject of the autopilot, I was really impressed with the auto takeoff. The jet also has an auto recovery system that seems to work pretty well. And overall, when the aircraft is working well, it actually feels pretty sophisticated in terms of how it operates. Just before we sum up, we'll touch on the FPS. Unfortunately, the aircraft is a little bit of a frame hog. 
Overall I was losing about 25 FPS versus the default Cessna 152. Anyway, I'll summarise the F-35, discounting the crash to desktop situation for now, as there's absolutely no way that India Fox Techo can continue to let those issues run. I would say in terms of all of the usual categories that we look at, the India Fox Techo F-35, not necessarily anything special. As I said, the jet is above average, but it's not right up there with the very best. As a machine though, as an experienced India Fox Techo, I've actually done a pretty great job with the Lightning. It's such a unique aircraft, very impressive in terms of how it operates. Once again, quite unlike anything else that I've ever flown in the sim. So if India Fox Techo can fix up the crash desktop issues, then I would say that the aircraft is well worth picking up for that reason alone. Anyway guys, as always, I do hope you enjoyed the video and found it to be of use. If you did, then please consider giving it a like. If you want to see more content from the channel, then please consider subscribing as well. If you have any comments or questions for me, you can leave those down in the comments section below, and I'll always do my best to answer them. As ever, a huge thank you to my channel members and patrons for all of your support, very much appreciated. I hope all of you are having a great day wherever you are, take really good care, and I will see you all again soon.